When talking about theater, what comes to mind? Definitely the works of William Shakespeare and the dramas and tragedies of his stories. Or maybe you think of musicals and the amazing live performances put on by the actors. Maybe you even think of comedy shows like The Book of Mormon and Avenue Q. One thing that doesn't come to most people's minds when discussing theater, however, is work that deals with disturbing, disgusting, and bleak subject matters. There are many playwrights who discuss war, death, and violence in their work, but few have ever crafted stories so confrontational and so seemingly unstageable as British playwright Sarah Kane. Born to a journalist mother in Essex County, Kane grew up in a deeply religious household, although she would turn to atheism at the age of 17. As a teenager, Kane was interested in theater, and ended up directing her school's productions of Chekhov and Joan Littlewood's plays. She would go on to study at the University of Bristol and Birmingham, graduating with an honors in drama and a master's in playwriting. Throughout her career, she would run workshops in Bulgaria and Spain, and have her plays produced throughout Europe. Originally planning to be a poet, she decided theater would be a more effective way of portraying her thoughts and feelings. Sarah Kane wrote of this decision, stating, Theater has no memory, which makes it the most existential of the arts. No doubt that is why you keep coming back in the hope that someone in a dark room somewhere will show me an image that burns itself into my mind. Now while not much is known of Sarah Kane's personal life, it's clear that her upbringing and her contact with religion was a great influence on her work. When criticized of her work's use of excessive violence, she answered, The reading I did in my formative years was the incredible violence of the Bible. It was full of rape, mutilation, war, and pestilence. Throughout her career, she would finish five plays as well as a short film for Channel 4. I wanted to share the story of one of her most well-known works, Cleanse, so everyone unfamiliar with her work could get a sense of what they were like and then briefly discuss the rest of them. Cleanse follows a group of inmates in a university operating like an institution designed to get rid of society's undesirables. Now, this will be a very abridged version because I don't think I can say all of this on YouTube, so just know that in the actual story, it's worse. Cleansed opens with Graham, a patient at this hospital approaching Tinker, the warden of the prison. They argue about whether they are friends, and then Tinker kills Graham by giving him a lethal dose of some drugs. We then cut to Rod and Carl who are arguing about whether or not they love each other. They eventually kiss and start a romantic relationship which is strictly forbidden. So in response, Tinker periodically comes into their cells and cuts out his tongue, makes him swallow jewelry, and amputates Carl's legs before eventually killing Rod in front of him. This story intercuts with Robin and a new patient, Grace, who is also Graham's brother. Grace is haunted by visions of her dead brother, while Robin begins to develop feelings for her. Throughout these visions, it is revealed that Grace and Graham had an incestuous relationship. After suffering continuous abuse at the hands of Tinker and being rejected by Grace, Robin hangs himself. The story ends with Grace and Carl having sex change operations and Tinker leaving the institute to have sex with an exotic dancer. Besides Cleansed, she also wrote Blasted, an anti-war story that follows a hateful man and a naive woman taking refuge in an expensive hotel in the middle of a violent war zone. As the story goes on, the hotel gets more and more destroyed, bringing with it a soldier that confesses to taking part in the genocide and torture of the people in this town. I don't want to give too much of the story away, but it ends with a suicide and the consumption of a human baby. Interestingly enough, however, Kane began writing this play while still studying at Birmingham, and the first two scenes were performed in front of the public audience, which led to finding her agent, who would eventually bring the play to the Royal Court Theatre. She would then write Skin, a short film for Channel 4, which followed a racist skinhead falling in love with a black woman, and their relationship taking a very violent turn. The movie is available for free on YouTube, so I've put a link to the director's YouTube channel in the description. Then came Phaedra's Love, which to my knowledge was the only of her works to have ever been commissioned. The job was to make a play based on a classical text, so she chose Seneca's Phaedra, a story about the Queen Phaedra and her obsessive lusts for her stepson. At this point, the work of Cain began to take a more experimental turn, as it abandoned straightforward narratives in favor for a more poetic and non-linear story. Crave follows four characters named A, B, C, and M in a discussion that deals with pain and love, violent crimes, drug addiction, mental health, and incest. Being her fourth play, Sarah Kane's name had already garnered lots of controversies, so in order to distance herself from the preconceived notions of her work, the play was advertised with the fictional writer's name, Marie Kelvedon. 
Now before talking about her final work, I have to briefly discuss another aspect of her life. Throughout her life, Sarah Kane dealt with severe depression and was hospitalized twice. Her agent said she didn't like taking pills because they numbed her response to the world, which is of course what they're supposed to do, but as an artist, it's extraordinarily difficult if your responsive level is made less intense. What do you do? Take pills and take away the despair? But despair also engenders knowledge in some way, and that knowledge fuels your understanding of the world and therefore your writing. But at the same time, you want to exercise the despair. She tried to weigh it up all the time. Kane's plays frequently dealt with difficult subject matter, often finding the disturbing in the beautiful and vice versa. So it was no surprise that her final play, 4.4 A Psychosis, would end up being one of the most personal and confrontational looks into depression. The play has no setting, it has no real characters, we just listen to a conversation that deals with causes of depression, how effective medication is, and what a depressed mind really desires. Sadly, Kane wouldn't live long enough to see its premiere performance. On February 17th, 1999, Kane's flatmate found her unconscious, having taken 150 antidepressants and 50 sleeping pills. She was rushed to the hospital, and when resuscitated, was very upset that her attempt had not succeeded. She was admitted to a general ward at the hospital and was visited by her agent. Thinking back on that experience, he had this to say. She was extraordinary. She looked happy, healthy. She was very funny. She was brimming with self-confidence. I took her 200 cigarettes, which we hid under the bed. We talked about everything under the sun. We did talk about suicide. We did talk about God. We did talk about plays, we did talk about friendship, and then after I'd given her the fags, I just kissed her on the forehead and I said I love you, and she said I love you too, and that was the last time I saw her. In the early morning of the 20th of February, Kane was found in the bathroom hung by her own shoelaces. She was 28 years old. Since then, many of her friends have come out and said that Sarah Kane talked about taking her own life frequently. Her experience with the theater industry seemed to have affected her a great deal as well. The playwright Edward Bond, one of Kane's friends, wrote, Kane had personal problems, but she was destroyed by the theater industry. Drama had been her umbilical lifeline, but the theater industry turned it into the rope with which she hanged herself. It's a tragedy she wasn't able to get the help she needed, but the influence of her work continues to live on. Her disturbing but uncompromising look at difficult subject matters, mixed with her unique stories and unproducible stage directions, redefined what theater could be. If you have yet to read any of her work and you think you can stomach it, I highly recommend checking her out. Sorry that this video isn't super in-depth, my knowledge of playwriting and theater is very limited, but I still wanted to talk about Sarah Kane in some capacity on this channel. Hope you enjoyed and learned something new. Peace.